Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Behind the Human. I'm your host, Mark Champagne, and it's my job to unpack the stories and mental fitness practices of people living at the top of their game personally and professionally. Today, we have Michael Sanders on the show, who is the co-founder and chief storyteller at Horizon, creators of Sequence, the leading development platform for integrating Web3 into games. Sequence is on a mission to make Web3 easy, fun, and accessible for everyone. He's also the author of the best-selling book, Ayahuasca, and Executive's Enlightenment. Who are you? That's a fantastic question, man. Um, I'm someone who loves to play. I, my, my, three val- my three main values in life are love, openness, and play. Mm-hmm. And I believe that the fabric of our existence of reality is love, that it's the creative force behind all things. Uh, that it's responsible for the Big Bang and every one of its predecessors, uh, every work of art, every painting, every song, the reason why children are born, galaxies explode and stars supernova, and why the grass grows through the pavement. It's you, it's me, it's boundless, it's everywhere. So I, I really feel as though like I'm an expression of love that we all are. Um, and yeah, you know, I feel as though I'm an aspect of this oneness and expression of God um, or an expression of all or the universe or the omniverse, whatever language people like to use. Um, and yeah, I really, I really want to, and I, I enjoy enjoying life, you know, like mm, I enjoy yeah. playing because I feel as though play is an expression of gratitude for life itself. And you know, I practice gratitude every single morning because I think, you know, we all experience scenarios in life and there's, they happen. And then how we respond to them, I think is what defines us and what will shape our trajectory. And so I'm, I'm constantly practicing gratitude because like any human, I get frustrated at times. I get into negative emotional states on occasion and just expressing gratitude for the broader picture. And even oftentimes those very challenging situations to recognize that, and this is something that I I fundamentally believe that each and every moment unfolds in exactly the manner it does to provide us with the most enriching experience of life imaginable. And even if something feels really difficult in the moment and it can, you know, I've been very dark experiences in my life. Yeah, I've had suicidal contemplations at different times in my life. And yet though some of those dark experiences have been one of the most some of the most teaching experiences of my life and have been some of the biggest catalysts for growth that I am so tremendously grateful for. Um so yeah, I know you asked me who I am and it's uh I have about a hundred million questions for that <laughs> response. <laughs> yeah, that's a I, deep, deep, yeah. beautiful beautiful response to who am I? I mean, I have to ask that have those three values always been a part of your life or have you evolved into them? Like when you've clearly thought of a question like this, maybe posed in different ways, but there's some thought, uh, definitely some deep kind of contemplation around, uh, an answer like what you just gave. Most people can't answer a question like it from in that level of detail. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I think you might be the first person who's ever asked me that. And so, wow, I was trying to, I was like actually thinking like, how do I, how do I answer that? You know, because the default is you go to the titles and yeah, uh, it's my job, I've done this, blah, blah, blah. Um, and yeah, so I've certainly evolved into those values. I've, I mean, I've always felt this trust in existence, in the omniverse that everything's going to work out. Um, even though like at a young age, I experienced some very tumultuous scenarios, but I still just have this deep knowing, like it, it's all going to work out. And it was like this reassuring presence and knowing, mm. um, did you have mentors that kind of instilled that into you or it just came from within? I think it came from within, um, like my, you know, my parents were always there to comfort me, but they, they had, a at at different times they had like a their 
relationship wasn't the the best. So they were, you know, they had their challenges in communicating and stuff. So sometimes they'd be arguing with each other and that would kind of frighten me as a child. And, yeah. um, and, you know, they would individually tell me everything's okay, but I feel as though I, there was some higher order or something from within that was reassuring me on an even deeper level. Um, and so I've always, I've always felt trust and yeah, I was going to say I've always felt love and I have to some degree, but I think the love piece really became more prominent around the age of 23 when I saw the film Avatar, actually, because wow. I, starting around the age of 16 with my first Mushrooms experience, I I started to per- understand everything as being super interconnected, like everything's interconnected, it's all one. At the same time, I saw the world as oftentimes dark and competitive. And then when I saw Avatar, I I actually had mono at the time and it just, it inspired something in me where I was like, whoa, like, yeah, it's all interconnected, but it, it's actually loving and beautiful mm, yeah. uh, more so than it is dark and competitive. And so then I just, I like my friends at the time jokingly referred to it as my enlightenment. Um, but I just <laughs> started perceiving everything as love. And so I think that's really when that value kind of was more deeply solidified within me. Not that I called it a, a light value at the time, but I, yeah. I, I think that that's kind of when it became more prominent. And then um, openness is, yeah, I think that's always been there. Although I haven't defined it. I, 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 I'm, I probably didn't define it until maybe eight years ago. Um, but I think just like open-mindedness, o- openness to idea, not trying to judge things, um, has just intuitive to my being and then play is play is a value that's really like a reminder and aspirational you know like i do play but it's also all i'm always like man you got to play because i have driven myself into extreme burnout just from working so hard at things that i love that like at things that are and can be playful but i go so hard into them that I have driven myself to just extreme exhaustion. And then that's, it's, it happened through movement. Like I was, I, I'm, I love moving like exercise and working out. And I was at one point trying to achieve a one arm handstand, a one arm chin up, a 400 pound squat, become a better dancer, like become more mobile, because just in, expand my movement vocabulary. I was training in, intensely 14 times per week while working a full-time job and running a separate startup. And like, never resting ever, like literally ever. And, but you know, that's something, the reason I was into movement is because like, I love it, but then I just took it to this extreme level that was super unhealthy that like after a certain point, similarly, like running a company that I adore, I've gone too hard in the past where then I burned myself out, you know? So the play is there to bring lightheartedness to scenarios to always like, because I, I really believe that life on earth is a game and a really fun game and like the most compelling game I can possibly imagine. And I think that if you live it with loving intentions, you can achieve and experience anything your heart desires, especially if you're out there serving others and trying to help and do good things. Um, and so it, it's both a reminder of like what I believe we exist in, in which is a mm-hmm. game. And then, yeah, to just, take a step back and like relax and just experience the moment and not be so goal oriented just be and you know whether it's dance or just having a conversation like this with a friend um yeah to just be playful they're just beautiful reminders i i i mean they're beautiful values of course but just hearing you talk about how they how they you know integrate into your life i can't help but feel a lightness even in myself of of yeah, we need these reminders because yeah. when we step outside of our container that we have together here, there's the rest of the world happening that is, you know, or I, I shouldn't say is, can be really heavy. And depending on what you let in, of course, and and how you uh, process, you know, things that are happening in the world or things that are potentially going to happen like it's it's heavy and we see this obviously in all the all the studies and the data and people like society's not doing well in general with that um so we need these 
A, we need tools. And, and I know you have a lot of those as well, but these reminders with the values. And I think that's just a beautiful way to just kind of zoom up a little bit, right? And just take a pause yeah. and breathe and like, okay, yeah. Because we're born with all this. It's like we, we, we wouldn't learn how to walk or crawl if we weren't curious and, and playful to reach and yeah. take, you know, d- do this kind of stuff. Obviously, love is, is at the core of everything and being open to try different things. So it's, they're all there. It's just they get s- kind of stuffed down as we go through the rat race, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, and then, you know, hopefully at one point we, we have an, a, an experience or some sort of um, avatar moment, let's just say, and, and you know, things change, right? Or perspective yeah. shifts. So everything that you described though, that is that all, that was all like the, the 14 hours of exercise movement and all that stuff. That was all pre ayahuasca experience and whatnot. Those was with the other companies, right? Yeah. In media, oh, well, right? Was it media that it was a media company of some sort you're running before? Yeah. I was a vice president of an advertising agency. I was simultaneously uh, running a startup in like peer-to-peer betting, which I wasn't, I just thought it was a good idea, but I wasn't that passionate about, which I think is why it was burning me out in part. Cause like, yeah, I don't actually care about betting. Um, I just, (laughs) I just knew people wanted to do it and I'm like, Oh, it's probably possible. And so I was trying to figure it out. Um, but I mean, even at my current company, which I adore horizon, I have burned myself out because I've just got, even with the lessons of ayahuasca and everything I have, I have burned myself out um, twice, in fact, (laughs) over the course of six and a half years. Um, And I've learned tremendously from them. And now I feel more balanced and I'm more disciplined about I'm very much I'm more focused on sleep now um, and just recognizing. some, Some of it's circumstantial, too. Like there were times where I was like, man, like we're working on this super high intensity thing and like there's a time window and it really felt like I had to be cranking like 15 to 20 hour days for like five months straight. And even including weekends, the weekends were like 10 to 12 hour days, but, and then we completed the goal. And, and then I was like, well, I was so burnt out and I'm like, okay, like you can't put yourself in that situation again, because it's it's too extreme. Um, But at the simultaneously, like I expanded my capacity for what, I'm capable of. So it is a double-edged thing, but I I learned tremendous lessons through it. And so now I feel much more balanced. I'm just not yet, um, I'm not yet, I'm going to use the word arrogant, arrogant enough to say that I'll never burn myself out again. Like, I don't believe I will because I I think I I have the tools. Um, But, you know, things are circumstantial and sometimes there's an occasion you need to address and you just, I I can't say that for sure, but I I feel much better equipped now. Yeah. Well, I, it's it's interesting. I don't know the time frame of of those two ex- burnout experiences because since I've met you, and even even in scheduling this this episode, you strike me as as someone who, at least in our interaction, has has been like very focused on the most important task or the most important goals and priorities. Right? Of like, you're not afraid to say. Because others would be like, okay, yeah, let's just jam in a podcast at this time and, and get it done. But you're, you know, in a respectful way, and I respect you for that, actually, saying, uh, like, I can't do it for the next three months, let's say. I'm, like, focused, at which mm-hmm. which I think is 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 admirable. It's, it's I think, uh, myself included, um, it's a good reminder to just, okay, what are, what are the priorities right now? And even though a lot of things could look interesting and, and we know, I mean, you know, I hope that, you know, obviously our interaction this evening leaves us both energized, uh, it is for me so far, but, um, there's a lot of good things that we can fill our days with or our, our schedules with. There's no shortage of those. So it's just having the the discipline to be like, okay, you know, we've got a priority set here. Yeah, yeah. totally, man. Cause yeah, like basically every weekday now, my, my time is just basically blocked between 7 30 AM and like 9 PM. You know, that's when I'm wor- like, I, I meditate in the morning and then I'm move like whether it's, I do like intense training, like three days a week now, and then kind of light, activity for, on the other four days of the week um or like a bike ride or something and th- that's usually for an hour and a half after i meditate and you know sometimes when i'm if i'm doing an intense workout in the rest periods i'm like on slack and drink some work but it's like 
basically from 7 30 to like 9 p.m it's dedicated to either it's like the meditation the workout and then i'm just in like horizon mode yeah and so scheduling things in there it's, it's actually difficult for me because it's just um I mean, I'm sure you know what it's like, right? Like sometimes if you look at your calendar and it's just stacked, it's a bit overwhelming because yeah. you you know, like, well, I need to think too. Like there needs to be a t- and I need to close my eyes and I need to ponder and I need to look at the sky because sometimes your best ideas and solutions come when you get out of the to-do list yeah. and you take a broader view. And so I'm very cognizant of just not overstacking because like it, it's pretty stacked, you know, it's not like not total empty space. It's like, it's a lot of, there's a lot of things happening. So I need to leave some empty space and there's just like a certain threshold where I'll look at my calendar and I'm like, there's too much in here. And yeah. that's going to be, if I pers- continue with this, it's going to be detrimental to my performance and, and my well being. So I need to just delay some things, postpone them, cancel them, whatever it is. Yeah. It's so, I mean, I adopted a practice, uh, probably four or five years ago now at this point, where every Friday, there's an automatic kind of a 3 p.m.-ish meeting that's set with myself. That's 30 minutes. And it's just a review. And it's it takes... It's never canceled. It may shift a little bit, but for the most part, I really try to keep that time slot because it's just... I find it's not at the end of the day, so it's not like you're trying to rush to kind of cap things off or get to a dinner or something like that. Um, but it's still the end of the week. And and I just ask three questions. You know, what what did I learn this week? What would I have changed this week? And what can I celebrate about this week? Sure. And I do it by looking at my calendar, typically, and my journal just quickly to see kind of what happened. And I just find so many times where be like, oh, you know what, Thursday, to your point, like felt stacked. Like I, I, I was back to back or something and there was no time to think and like I can still feel that what's next week look like and it's just Mm. this like micro moment to make some adjustments right so I'm curious for you like do you have is there some sort of ritual for you on on reviewing you know your weeks or months or or whatever that looks like yeah um every morning during my meditation I it's usually it's anywhere between 20 and 30 minutes and um I spend kind of the first half of it expressing gratitude and I do it for at least five things. Sometimes it's more like I've gone on three hour meditations where I just name every single thing I can think of and express gratitude for it. But my general practice is, yeah, I spend like say 10 to 15 minutes expressing gratitude for certain things. And, you know, oftentimes it's like my fiance or my company, or it'll just be like breath or grass yeah. or play or a tree, you know, just like anything to just recognize that there's such beauty and reason to be grateful in even some of the most mundane things. Yeah. Um, and Did you do and that then, out loud or is this your thinking this? Like what's the no, practically just, speaking? I'm lying down. It's like right after I open my eyes, okay. after I, when I wake up in the morning, maybe I go to the washroom first, but then I'm yeah. just lying there, eyes closed, meditating. And I'm Mm -hmm. just expressing gratitude and like breathing in a meditative state, uh, like breathing into my full body, feeling my heart. Yeah. Um, I love that. And, and then the next half of my meditation is, uh, it's, it's a prayer actually, which is something I've started doing in maybe the past three months. And I never thought I'd be someone who said I would pray or I, growing up, I did not like the term God, um, it's taken on new meaning for me as I've, as I've gotten older um, and just had some experiences. <clears throat> but that second half of the meditation is prayer for things I want help with. Mm. And so I essentially pray to God or to all um, about things I want help with. And many of the things are recurring, you know, it's yeah. like um, emotional issues, let's say like a feeling of inadequacy in particular scenarios. And so it's constant like, hey, can I have help with this feeling here? You know, and like, I am enough, I am worthy, I am love, I am. And, um, you know, one of them is a prayer for with my company, like making sure that like asking for help so that I show up in a way that is um, beneficial to my health and well-being. 
Mm-hmm. And so it's that. like a, it's an ask for help, support, and a reminder as well. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, and so I, yeah, and then there's a few things, and it, it changes depending on the day because maybe the day before something happened, you know, maybe with a, I don't know, any scenario where I'm just maybe I'm reeling from it. Maybe I had a difficult conversation with somebody, and I'm just I'm still reeling from it, you know. So in that meditation, I'll reflect on and be like, hey, like, can I have help? working through and harmonizing and learning from this. Um, and so, and then I'll, I'll continue to pray on it for as many days until I feel as though it's resolved. Okay. And there are some items that like I, they're in there every day. Like I, I've only been doing this practice for three months. So maybe eventually that some of them will like, some of them have already changed, you know, and maybe all of them will rotate over time. Um, but that is like the period of reflection. So it's kind of a daily check-in. And then at the on New Year's Eve, every the morning of New Year's Eve on like December 31st, I always wake up and I do like usually ends up being like anywhere between a one and a half and three hour meditation where I just chronologically reflect on my year. Wow. And like just from memory. Yeah, just from memory. And I love um, that. Yeah, I, I just express gratitude for all the the things and all the lessons. And I kind of, yeah, I do, I do have a good like chronological memory. Um, no kidding. <laughs> and, yeah. I mean, th- this originated during my first ayahuasca ceremony. I actually, that just, just came to, it was on New Year's Eve of 2013 going into 2014 and just intuitively started happening. And so for the last, uh, I guess 10 New Year's Eves, I've, I've done that. Mm-hmm. And, um, the the reflection part, not not the ayahuasca part. That was only the one time. But um, the um, yeah. So those those are the big reflections. And then like you know, in in business at our company, we do like periodic reviews and retrospectives yeah. and things of that nature. But on a personal level, those are my that that's my cadence. It's pretty. I've been kind of a sim, similar time frame. I've been playing with this this idea of or this practice of asking for guidance myself. For for me, cool. it's uh, I, be, I I do it in in a journaling fashion and just ask the question, like something in relation to you know what's your higher self telling you right now or uh, a higher kind of uh, similar to what you're saying. I, I feel like I'm still kind of bouncing around on terms like you know god or universe or energy like some there's something you know is the way that i i kind of look at all of this uh and i'm asking for guidance from whatever that something is and i'm just blown away especially if i've done some sort of meditation or or starting this with some sort of clear mind like you know to do this in the middle of the day is is you know i think you get a lot of surface level probably results like that but my pen just fires. It's like I'm free writing, you know, pages and pages. And you, you get to the end of it and like, holy smokes, like there's so much guidance here. It, like, it, I mean, from, I don't know, myself, something. Like, it's <laughs> it's wild, right? Like if we just yeah. ask. Right. You know, just ask. Like there's, and, and you know, we're, we really aren't alone in in a lot of these experiences. And there's, as long as you can just trust and be open, coming back to, you know, one of your values and just, you know, trust yourself and, 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 and open to that guidance and ask the question. Powerful. Yeah, dude, that's awesome. I, I'm going to try that. I've never asked, you know, what, what is my higher self saying or what is, God are all saying for me in this moment, or how can it help me in this moment? And then write. I, I've certainly journaled many times, but just not with that prompt. And I've I've found writing for me is I mean I've loved writing since I was a, a child, um, and I found writing to be a very uh, clarifying and crystallizing process for me. So there are yeah. times. For example, there are times during my meditations where I'm not actually able to process or work through an emotional topic because it's just, I don't know, it's too nebulous. And then I will just go to my, and I go to my, I actually, I do all my writing on my computer. Like I'm not much of a pen to paper person anymore. Um, But I just go and I write on like a Google doc and I just start writing, you know? And then usually it's like, I don't know, it'll be anywhere between like a page and a half and four pages. And I feel like, okay, that's, that's what it is, you know? And yeah. then it's like, okay, yeah, there's a I, feeling there. Yeah. And now I know how to think through it or I know what my next step needs to be. Um, 
So it's it's similar to what you've suggested, but it hasn't been directed by that prompt. And I, I think that's super interesting. So I'm going to experiment with it. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, and I, I'm back and forth. I mean, th- this whole podcast came out of of a digital journal that that I co-founded. So I mean, I cool. I'm back and forth with either technology for for journaling, or sometimes it just feels like I need a nice pen and a good quality piece of paper. And, and for everyone listening, I only bring that up because. I think journaling has an interesting rap behind it or people it's easy for people. And I put myself in this, this camp at one point as well, that you get, we get hung up with the tools. Like totally. I hear the pen to paper camp where it's, I need to see all my journals lined up from the years and be able to like open those up and, and jump in, which I, I get that, uh, uh, you know, and I've got some of that as well. Then on the digital front as well, I've got thousands of entries in in you know a couple of different apps since my our app we shut it down, and you know there's a lot of technological benefits of like on this day three years ago this is what you wrote about and and whatnot, but with all of it, the thing that trumps it all is the practice, yeah you know and just just you know I, I would just say like don't ever let and I'm not speaking to you Michael I'm just everyone kind of like something comes up, just use the tool that feels right and, and do the reflection. Like that's the practice behind journaling, right? Totally, uh, and just go for it. Yeah. 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 I mean, some, sometimes for me, like, yeah, meditation, journaling won't help. And then I dance and then dance just yeah solves, solves it all, you know? Yeah. And it's, there's not much thinking. I'm not like mentally processing it. It's more like physically I'm moving just energy moving, yeah. and then I just have clarity afterwards. So, yeah, that's a really good reminder because even I, you know, I, I, I intentionally shift my meditation practice around every, like I, I tend to always do it in the morning, but I, I shift kind of the structure of my meditation around because I don't want to feel too much compulsion that it needs to be a certain way. Yeah. Um, and I've gotten into that pattern before where it's like, oh shit, I missed my meditation or, oh, it was only eight minutes because that's all the time I have instead of 20. And it's like, no, like that's okay. And it's like, yeah, yeah. So now, now off, you know, like I feel like maybe twice a month on a Saturday or Sunday, maybe three times, I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to meditate this morning. Like I'm just going to go outside and chill and walk, which is also meditative, you know? Oh, so totally. it's, um, yeah, I like to just kind of interrupt some of the patterns so that I don't feel too like entrained to them or indoctrinated to them. Yeah. No, it's, it's so important. It's, it's anytime we can, you know, bring some stillness to our mind it's in any fashion i think it's it's a good thing and it, it's also yeah. a topic that the stuff tells like we we like literally just dove head first and jumped into the practical aspects of of these practices which i love uh, and i can continue forever on that topic but i do want to link it to well first and foremost just understand a little bit more about what you're doing and and what horizon's all about because uh, in a way, there's there's this this element of technology and innovation and growth and change and whatnot that is so beautiful and happening. I think you're part a lot of that with with what you're doing at Horizon. Yeah. But on the other side of that, you know, I really want to talk to people that are in the space that are also grounded with these kind of practices that we've been discussing to see, like how how do we bring this to more people in our teams as we go through a bunch of technological innovation and different, you know, uh, ways of work and seeing work? How do we handle that? Because, you know, biologically, we're just not programmed to to handle this level of volume, change, all of it, right? It's, it's, it's wild. So, so let's start just to give some context. What's Horizon all about? Yeah. So, we make Web3 easy, fun, and accessible for everyone. And Web3 is a term that not everyone knows, um, but Web3 is this next generation of the internet that is powered by blockchains and oftentimes involves cryptocurrencies. And so our focus, we've built a developer platform called Sequence. So it's this all-in-one platform that allows game creators to integrate web three into their games and what it allows them to do is like create better ways of attracting users into their game better ways of monetizing users while delivering their players a better 
gaming experience mm. and one in which enables really symbiotic economies between players and creators. So for those who aren't familiar in in gaming, people spend hundreds of billions of dollars per year on in-game items. But unfortunately, they don't own any of these things. So, you know, people will buy trading cards or they'll buy cars or they will buy costumes and skins and yeah. um, all sorts of items in, in video games. And they don't own any of them. Like, it's just if the game disappears or shuts down, they just lose their money. Um, and, and they can't trade them in most cases. With what we're doing, we actually put those game items on the blockchain. So they exist in a decentralized manner so that the the players actually they truly own that digital item uh and then they can trade it so if you get bored of a game you could sell it you know take your oh, money I and see. go do something else with it um whether that's in another game or in the physical world you know you want to go i don't know pay for a portion of your rent or your groceries or whatever um and and furthermore there's all these opportunities for players to actually create content and games and then monetize those and have revenue shares between developers and players just ultimately creating these more symbiotic and distributed economies and and ecosystems and gaming's like really kind of where it starts but you know a lot of people talk about or you know especially a few years ago a lot of people were talking about the metaverse and i do think that this is it's coming. Um, whether it's called the metaverse or not remains to be seen, but um, the metaverse will be federated by blockchains. Uh, blockchains really serve as the data layer. Um, so it's what verifies and authenticates what is true. Um, sure. And then there will be different devices that allow you to experience the metaverse and different expressions, whether it's images or video or your mobile or your laptop or a Google or like a goggle set or, you know, like a VR headset, you'll be able to access the metaverse and all of those different formats. But it's really the blockchains that federate it on a data layer and ensure that everything is interconnected. Um, and so what Sequence does, our platform, is it actually allows creators and developers to build on top of the blockchains. It enables the blockchains um, and then enables the users to seamlessly experience those games or consumer applications, or it could be financial applications too, um, any kind of application really. And then it also allows the players to own their items and just experience and enjoy all of these different virtual worlds. So what we really do is like we connect and enable this next generation of the internet through games um, and yeah, it may expand beyond games in the future. Um, I could very much see that happening, but our focus right now is on games because in part, you know, like play, you know, we yeah. talked about that, right? Like people yeah. love to play and it's really cool because you can just allow someone to experience the benefits of blockchain and crypto, because I think it, it's esoteric for a lot of people even still. Um, and so it's just like, oh, well, you're having fun and you get to own these items and you get to experience, you get this cool reward in a new virtual world that actually belongs to you. Um, and then they're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Like, games should definitely be this way, right? Yeah. You don't need to educate them about, like, oh, here are the technological underpinning and why decentralized currencies make sense and blah, 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 right? It's just like, have fun, yeah. benefit from it. Great. Uh, now, now you're in Web3. It's, uh, yeah, it makes total sense. Total sense. And I love that idea that, not not the idea, I mean, you're doing this essentially, the education piece. It's even for, for myself, like I have, I have some knowledge, but I would say I'm more curious than in terms of uh, my knowledge base and the way that you described everything. I, was, I found myself shaking my head. I'm like, oh, yeah, like I can see that. And I can also see what you're saying about where this expands mm -hmm. into other spaces. And you're, so you're the perfect person, I think, to ask this next question because again, having, we're going to run out of time on the, on your book, but I, I'm just going to put in the show notes because it's, I, I can't encourage, uh, that you're, you're writing enough for people to consume that, that experience. Cause it's just so speaking about journaling. I mean, I was writing a, a ton of questions as I was going through that and, and reflecting. Now I only bring that up because you strike me as someone, and I'm sure listeners can hear this or feel this as well, like you're very 
grounded and you have practices that like if i think of ayahuasca and and the ceremony and the rituals like now we're like we're going back thousands of years and there's like really foundational uh like nature involved and even you know your meditations and breathing and the, looking at the grass but then on the other side you're it, like the metaverse like so how do you being in how do you how do you live in both worlds Right. How do you how do you think about kind of where we're at with all of this and and like the the benefit of technology and what we're creating, but also knowing like the deep rooted, just the basics, yeah, yeah. you know? Yeah. So I'll start by saying I I adore both. Like I adore nature, being disconnected from technology or human made technology, um, and. I also adore human-made technology and yeah. what it affords us and the experiences you can have in digital environments and interaction and trade and commerce and all of these cool things you can create. So I love both. And something that I've felt and experienced a lot over the past couple of decades is that I... I believe we are already in a game, which is like, which could be a blockchain based virtual reality. Like that's might be what we exist in right now. Um, yeah. We might be playing this. We might be in this virtual reality, accessing it from like another dimension, you know, maybe by a headset or a haptic suit or who knows what kind of technology, because we might not even be human in this other dimension. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's possible. That's the thing. It's, it's yeah. totally possible. Totally, man. And I've, uh, yeah, I've had a lot of experience that indicated it, it is such. And so I, I see the, the metaverse or whatever the eventual term is, but we'll just use metaverse for this conversation. I see the metaverse as like another layer to that. It's mm. another layer of exploration. It's not better. It's not worse. It's just, it, I mean, it has the opportunity to kind of be whatever we want it to be. And that's why I think the values with which we infuse it are very important. So like, you know, the, our company values are love, openness, and play, because that's what we want developers to experience. That's what we want the end user to experience as well. And yeah, I, I think, man, like there's going to be so many cool experiences where like you and I will feel as though we're in the same physical environment, even like we'll be able to touch each other, you know, and we'll be able to make real eye contact. Yeah. which is something that different groups are working on. Because right now, you and I, have got to look at our screen and like yeah, the cameras. Yeah. We don't actually get to look each other in the eye. <laughs> and that's a very simple human thing, right? And, but you know how it is too. Like when you're in a, when you're in a room with people and there's conversation and multiple conversations, like the way that connections and ideas occur is different than when you do it on a Zoom call or a Google Meet. And so frequently our Zoom and Google meets are, you know, they're, they're time bound. It's like, oh, we're, we're starting this time and we're ending here. Whereas in physical social interactions, usually the time is a little more elastic. Like some people stay for five hours, some people leave after half an hour. So it's just, sure. and I, so I, I think the, the metaverse can afford all sorts of opportunities and that that's just like social interaction, but then there's games and like things that I can't even imagine yet. Um, I think we'll be able to explore the earth in a virtual way. Like if you and I wanted to be like, Hey, I wonder what it's like in the Himalayas, but yeah. I don't necessarily want to pay for a flight right now. And, you know, I need to be back in Toronto tomorrow. So I just want to have this virtual experience, but it could feel as real, right. Or, but maybe we could also go experience um, the Andromeda galaxy um, yeah. or we could experience a different point in time, like in the past or the future, uh, through a VR or metaverse experience. And then we can have these items in all these different places to represent who we are and we can trade those things and could win them and have economies around them. So I'm very fascinated by this exploration of another dimension, which I, I just think is an extension of what we already are and what we're already doing. So much so to the point that like, it, it's, um, I mean, I know by definition, the term artificial means human made. But to me, nothing is unnatural. Like everything is natural. Everything that humans create is natural. The same way that like if a beaver creates a beaver dam, 
or a, you know, a wolf creates a wolf den. No, no one looks at that. It's like, oh, what a bastardization of nature. Like it's, <laughs> yeah. that never, that never happens. Right. People are like, oh yeah, the animal built it. Well, we too are animals and we create things, you know, yeah. and our creations are just a little different. Um, so I, I love the interplay and the harmony of these things. And for, you know, to your point of, yeah, we have this rapid technological evolution occurring and how do you stay grounded? Because I don't, I wouldn't advocate for someone spending all day, every day looking at a screen or in a headset. So I think at least not now, because just the way the interfaces are, like, I think it's hard to just stare at a screen all the time, but maybe there's a point where it doesn't feel at all like you're staring at a screen because you like, you just feel as immersed in the metaverse as you do in this reality. um, The one that you and I are speaking in. And so, I, but I do think there are important things like, honestly, like hugging people, um, yeah. physical touch, and, you know, for, for most people, I know some people, they don't like physical touch. That's okay too. But like, if you do like seek it out, you yeah. know, hug your friends, hug people, you know, hug your neighbor. Like if they're open to it, um, stand barefoot on the grass, like spend time outside, get sunshine on your skin. Um, see your friends in person, see your family in person. Like you know, exercise, get in your body, like feel your body, get out of your mind or be in your mind and body simultaneously, like balanced, right? Like if you're into things like ice baths and saunas and meditation, like do those things because they're really good at like activating these biological beings that we are. Like I, I don't think we can separate ourselves from the fact that we, we have a physiology, we have a biology that responds to stimuli and particular ways. And like, I really believe we need physical activity and and bouts of intense physical activity. You know, we all know it releases endorphins. You feel great. It gives you more energy. Like we need that. Um, I'm sure you, you probably talked about this on another episode or in conversations, but like our software, like the way our consciousness and societies operate evolves much faster than our hardware does in our body. Our body is largely the same as it was to our ancestors tens of thousands of years ago. So it still requires like really good food, sunshine, movement, human touch, connection, social interaction in the physical world, not just the digital world. Um, And I think it's really good to disconnect from tech devices uh, every once in a while, you know, like one of my favorite, favorite experiences on earth is going to Burning Man been six times and, Every single time it's eight days with no connection to the internet, no phone. Like it's at the bottom of my suitcase tucked in my tent or RV and it never comes out. Yeah. And like, that is wow. an incredibly, it's like healing and cleansing. And like you end up, honestly, I, I think for anyone who's been to Burning Man, they start to recognize like we're a lot more telepathic than we realize. Um, and yeah, because when, once you disconnect from your phone you can connect to humans in another way yeah and we all know you know if you're in conversations with friends and someone pulls up the phone it's interruptive it's it's a bit it's a, it creates like a slight incongruity right a disconnection and it's okay that's the world we live in and sometimes people have to address something but it, it happens you know it can make a super engaged conversation and then you're like oh okay like pause and then you might not have the same rhythm when you resume so just imagine like eight consecutive days where seventy thousand people have all made that agreement essentially like, yep, I'm staying present and immersed. So I think Mm -hmm. all of these things are very important to stay grounded. And, um, I think it's, it it helps a lot. You know, I think a lot of people in today's world experience anxiety and I'm, I'm not a doctor, but I I think these practices that I'm describing are, and I, I, there's so many anecdotes with myself, with many friends. They're like, yeah, when they do these things, they don't experience anxiety. And then when oh, they yeah. don't do these things, they do experience anxiety. And I get there are outlier cases of even people who do all this stuff, they're still going to experience it. And that, that's fine. That's, you know, everyone's different. Um, but in general, I think these are all wonderful things to help ground people. Yeah. It's uh, no, for sure. I mean, there's what I love about what you shared is that you can enjoy both and it's not even just both it's i mean we're talking about you know uh kind of the the fast pace or future virtual worlds to like grounded kind of worlds but there's stuff in between all of that as well and it doesn't have to be binary which is 
how it's discussed often. It's like, no, like I think going back to one of your values again, like the openness, if we're just open to be curious and explore. And I think that added layer of, I'm going to bring this in more into my life as well of just who are we to say that this is the, this is the world that we absolutely live in that we think like there's so much out that you just have to start thinking about, you know, astrology and space and galaxies. I mean, come on. Like, are we really like, we're just the ones here on this little yeah. like floating planet. Um, and just, again, it, it, either, I, there's no answers right now, but just to be open that or have the perspective of we very, we may be in exactly what you're describing, some sort of game of some sort or something else, who knows, mm-hmm. but having that perspective, then I feel like lightens everything else around. Well, let's just explore, you know, let's totally, so damn serious about everything and get so hung up on, you know, uh, the next five years or a hundred years or whatever, and just explore and be open and whatnot and, and see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I think a lot of people, uh, there's a lot of conversation around AI right now. Right. And yeah. I think for good reason, it's very exciting. It, it's frightening for some people. And I, I think there are tremendous opportunities with it and there are concerns with it as well. Right. And sometimes I wonder like, is this an alien species that has, you know, kind of incepted us and yeah. incepted us to bring it into manifestation to manifest it into this world. Um, and is, and then like, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? Like maybe it's here to help. You know, or, yeah. or maybe or it's just a like, natural ma- evolution. Like exactly. there were dinosaurs it's, it's at one point. Now there are. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And now we have AI instead, right? And and then there's like, you know, or could it be a predator? Uh, maybe. I don't know. I like it doesn't seem that way, but maybe. And then I mean, we've also had predators at different times in our evolution. And it yeah, yeah probably made us stronger in some ways, right? So it's like I, you know, that classic um parable about the man who's like his horse runs away and then the neighbors say like, Oh, I'm so sorry to hear about your horse. Such a bad thing. And he's like, maybe. And then, you know, and his horse comes back and then people are like, Oh, your horse came back. Like, that's so good. And then he's like, maybe. And then (laughs) the next day or like a couple of years later, his son's riding his horse and uh, falls off the horse and breaks his leg. And then is everyone's like, oh, it's so unfortunate that your horse had to come back and then your son had to ride it and he had to break his leg. He's like, maybe. And then the son gets conscripted for the army, but he can't go because his leg's broken. And then, everyone's yeah. like, oh, that's actually good. You know, and he's like, maybe. Like you just, all of these things are all part of the journey. And that's why I, I really like the perspective and why I kind of embody it and remind myself of it all the time is just that every moment unfolds in the exact manner it does to provide us with the most enriching experience of life imaginable. And I I think that's the truth and whether it's placebo or not, you know, whether I'm like convincing myself of the truth, I, it, for me, it's a very helpful disposition Mm -hmm. uh, because then I can stay open to whatever's coming and being like, cool. Like, I actually think this is, good. Like this is going to be really wonderful in the long run and it's what's best. Yeah. I mean, I can't think of a better way to wrap the episode on that, that thought and perspective. Cause that's a, just a beautiful way to, you know, just leave our minds and that for me at least feels light, but excited and curious kind of all at the same time, which I don't know. I feel like life should feel like that the majority of the time but other things get in the way so i'm I'm gonna write that down and it's gonna it's gonna live n- near monitor i'm gonna inject that into i'm gonna pick up your you're gonna try out your meditation practice as well i really like that your flow to starting the day and and i'm just i'm super curious uh michael i'm like you really i mean i wrote a whole book essentially collecting questions and, and studying curiosity and being curious myself but i i feel like I need to just go outside and look up at, into the sky for an hour and just see what, because it just, you've really sparked uh, a lot of thought in, in all the right ways. So thank you 
I mean, I feel like literally we just touched the surface of what this conversation <laughs> could be, but yes. I want to respect our, uh, your time and, and whatnot. And I know you've had a long day and who knows, maybe we'll get a part two at one point because yeah. um, we, we've skipped over a lot, obviously, but uh, I feel I feel really good about what we covered. So I, I, I hope you do as well and, and want to thank you for, for coming on and just, I think, accepting the invitation to just flow with where this conversation went because it it definitely um as i'm sure listeners can feel it it was definitely not scripted and we just went for it so thank yeah, you man. thank you as well um i i i find this so fun like this is play for me you know just having a conversation with a friend and seeing where it goes it's it's yeah one of the most enjoyable experiences i can think of so thank you for having me mark oh right back at you until the next one brother 